Uh, okay. I don't know where members are running around, yeah, so they're on their way. So I'm going to start, yeah. and when they come, they can speak on the bills that they um, are passing today. Okay. Uh, are we okay on the sound back there? Everyone fine? Okay, great. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, on today's stated agenda, first the council will vote on the following land use items. Uh, two sidewalk cafes, one in Councilmember Rodriguez's district, we're approving, and one is a withdrawal in Councilmember Ben Kalos's district. It's a bunch of land use items, Hudson Boulevard and Park Text Amendment. I'm not going to talk about the details. If you have questions, I'm happy to talk about them. Willowbrook Avenue in the Bronx, it's 134 units of affordable uh, uh, apartments. Uh, 280 Richards Waterfront Authorization in Councilor Menchaca's district. <clears throat> uh, a bunch of tax exemptions. ANCP 105 West 105th Street. It's a UDAP uh, up in Councilmember Levine's district. Berrien Gardens, an Article 11 tax exemption in Councilmember Amprey Samuel's district. Hudson Pierce 2 in Councilmember Mark Levine's district. And then we're going to vote on the following pieces of legislation. Introduction 401A, sponsored by Council Member Paul Vallone, would require the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to ensure that full service animal shelters are operated in all five boroughs by July 1st, 2024. While the city operates facilities to receive lost, stray, or homeless dogs and cats uh, in the Bronx and Queens, neither borough is currently served by a full service animal shelter. Um, when Councilman Verlone gets here, I'm happy to have him speak on this bill. I co-sponsored this bill with him when I chaired the health committee and I feel really passionate about this. I adopted my cat from the Manhattan ACNC shelter uh, three years ago and I feel really strongly about having animal shelters in all five boroughs. Uh, next, we'll vote on a comprehensive package of legislation to provide opioid and drug treatment and prevention services. Uh, the opioid, come on up Justin. The opioid epidemic, opioid, and, um, we're going to vote on a comprehensive package of legislation to provide opioid and drug treatment and prevention services. The opioid epidemic has affected the lives of too many New York families, and I'm proud of my colleagues who are passing bills today to provide help to New Yorkers who are in dire need. Introduction 615A, sponsored by Councilmember Diane Ayala, would require the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to provide opioid overdose reversal drugs, such as naloxone, to all syringe exchange programs operating in the city. It would require the DOH MH uh, ensuring that all syringe exchange staff members are properly trained on overdose prevention and reversal. Councilmember Ayala is unable to uh, join us today, but I congratulate her on this. Councilmember Justin Brannon, who's with us, is a sponsor of two pieces of legislation in this package, Introduction 618A would require the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to develop age-appropriate educational materials on drug and opioid awareness and prevention. And Resolution 197 would call upon the New York City Department of Education to include drug awareness education concerning opioids in the New York City public school curriculum. And I want to invite Councilmember Brandon to come up and speak on his legislation. And congratulations, it's your first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Congratulations. Thank congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty simple. Um, you know, the opioid crisis, obviously, uh, we know is, is no secret and, and no one is immune and does not discriminate. Um, when I was a kid in schools, <clears throat> they taught us about crack cocaine, the dangers of crack cocaine and that kind of stuff, and it worked for me. Um, scared me and, and made sure that I, I, I never did drugs and never went down that road. So it was certainly helpful, and I was just surprised to know that there wasn't really curriculum in place in the DOE uh, to teach kids about opioids and what to look for and what it means and, and that kind of stuff. So uh, we're not allowed to change curriculum because of the state, um, but we can. We got creative with it and found a way to uh, get it done through um, pamphlets and, and disseminating information um, on a yearly basis. So when the kids start school, they'll be told, um, you know, handed out a, a pamphlet, a leaflet, whatever it is, and, and have instructors come into the school to talk to them about it. So. Um, just about equipping everyone with as many tools as you possibly can. I think misinformation and lack of information can be deadly when it comes to the opioid crisis. So hopefully this uh, this helps, and I'm, I'm very excited to pass my first uh, my first bill. Thank you. Congratulations, Thank you. and I'm really proud of your leadership this week Thank and you. what's happened in oh, your district okay. in, in Bay Ridge. Um, so I'm, we might talk about that later, but right on. congratulations. 
Introduction 623A, sponsored by Council Member Andrew Cohen, would require the fire department uh, to report quarterly to the city council and to the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene on the number of opioid antagonists the department has available, the number of emergency medical uh, technicians, EMTs, and other departmental employees trained to administer opioid antagonists, and the number of opioid overdose reversal drugs that are actually administered by EMTs. So I invite Councilmember Cohen to come up and speak on his bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think that the uh, FDNY and the EMTs are doing really heroic frontline work uh, with the administration of naloxone, but uh, we want to capture the data. We want to know what's going on. I think it will give us a better handle on the scope of the ep epidemic in the city. Uh, so I'm very proud to have sponsored this bill. I think that uh, it will really help us get a better handle on what's happening really on the ground in the Bronx. Uh, I represent the 5-2 uh, precinct, which is really, uh, I believe, in Bronx County, unfortunately. Uh, one of the epicenters of opioid overdoses. Uh, so I'm very pleased that we're getting this done. I want to thank the speaker. I want to thank Chair uh, Diana Ayala uh, and my colleague uh, Alika Ampri Samuels and uh, Bob Holden for their support too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, and next we have a package of bills, three bills. Councilmember Richie Torres has three bills in this package. Introduction 667A would require the Department of Social Services to refer individuals residing in the Department of Homeless Services shelters or HASA, HIV and AIDS service administration facilities that suffered a non-fatal overdose to additional services. Introduction 668A would require the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to provide opioid overdose prevention and reversal training to the public. DOHMH already provides such trainings, but this law would codify existing trainings and ensure they occur as long as necessary. An introduction 669A would require the Municipal Drug Strategy Advisory Council, a, council, a law the council established in 2017 and comprised with healthcare professionals, advocates, and persons suffering from substance misuse disorder to include in its biannual report the number of opioid overdose reversal drugs that are distributed by city agencies. Councilmember Torres is not able to join us today, but I want to thank him for his work on these bills. And then lastly, uh, introduction 717A, sponsored by Councilmember Jamani Williams, would require that the New York City Police Department to report quarterly to the City Council and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene on the number of opioid antagonists the department has available, the number of officers trained to administer opioid antagonists, and the number of opioid overdose reversal drugs administered by NYPD officers. We've seen a lot of lives saved by NYPD officers around the city who have given naloxone when they've showed up, and to get those numbers in a real way is really important. Uh, Councilor Williams isn't here, but I congratulate him on that. Any questions on the stuff we just talked about? Grace. So there's a, there's a rezo too that calls on the DOE to change the curriculum, to update the curriculum. So the, the, the legislation is, works with... Um, oh, there is legislation, it's not just the rezo. No, it's, yeah, there's legislation and the rezo. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The rezo calls on the state to change, update the curriculum. The yeah. legislation is on reporting, right? Yeah, it's, well, yeah, and, it, and it, it, goes, it goes through, I think, DYCD to do... Um, you know, disseminate information. Exactly. We had to get creative with it because we couldn't change it ourselves. Because of mayoral control. Yeah. It's hard for us. Is it necessary because DOE wouldn't do this on its own? I mean, why um, necessary to legislate this? Well, that's a good question. I mean, because I was just shocked to find out that it wasn't currently happening. I just assumed it was happening, um, and I was told that it wasn't. So we had to get creative to find a way to make it happen. Um, they wanted to talk about it and try to find a way to do it, but I still wanted to, you know, impress upon them that they had to do it. So that's why we did the bill. Yeah. Any other questions on the bills in front of us today? Yeah, you'll have. Can we talk about the Airbnb bill? I wasn't here. No, but we can talk about that in a, in a couple of minutes. Question. Yeah. Were the service training programs within the city, did they not have some kind of knock-on or knock-on frequency, or just some did and some didn't. So we saw sort of an uneven system in place across the city. 
and we wanted to ensure, given the services that were happening at these syringe exchange sites, and the, you know, we were having a conversation on the opioid, on the overdose prevention centers that the council pushed, setting up four of those sites across the city. We wanna make sure that all of these sites have what they need for people who may be coming there to make sure that no one loses their life. So Councilmember Ayala, uh, found out through her hearing, and it's why she put this bill forward, to make sure that across the board, syringe exchange sites have this medication. Is there a requirement about how many they need to have on hand? Um, I don't, I'm not sure. Is the staff, do you want No, there's not, Andrea, no. Anything else on this package? Okay, great, thanks. Um, you guys can leave or you can stick around. They may want to talk to you about Bay Ridge. Okay, so cool. you may want to stay around. Thanks. Oh, you can stay too. Oh. Okay, girl, who wants to, who wants to talk? Uh, Gloria. Uh, Speaker, yes. Two questions for you. The first, um, the mayor talked uh, this week about uh, the establishment of the opioid defense fund um, and that he is hoping the council will draw up legislation and he'll be able to do that that would uh, put limits on how much he can raise. Uh, where is that effort in the council? So the council has had conversations on this issue with the administration last year, before I was speaker, and again recently, but there is no agreement on a particular bill. There's been no bill that's been introduced. Um, so we're really, I think, at some preliminary stages where there have been conversations, but there's nothing happening anytime soon. I mean, my, my personal opinion is that uh, this is kind of a, you know, a COIB opinion is not a law, it's an opinion. And it's important for us to go by the advice of COIB. But this is an unregulated area. And I think it's important for us to, not just for the mayor or other people who may be affected right now, but for the future, actually have a regulatory framework in, in place that makes sense. Uh, we don't have that right now. Those are conversations that we have to have. Those conversations have begun, but um, I think it's an issue that's worthy of consideration, um, and I'm trying to figure out what the appropriate framework should be. Would you like to see, would, it, would you like to see an, an increase in how much a, a lawmaker can raise if the state defense fund is higher than $50? So I don't want to prejudge. First of all, I haven't had this conversation with my colleagues yet, and that's always important. Um, if we do this, again, this is not about the mayor or anyone else, but you know, Councilmember Rose unnecessarily for years had to deal with, in my opinion, something that was extraordinarily unfair, and the case ended up being dismissed. Um, she still has legal bills to pay off. I know the mayor has some. I don't know if there are other people. Fifty dollars, I think, doesn't make sense. It's a court opinion, but it's not a law, and I think we would have to balance what the appropriate amount would be. We haven't had those conversations yet, so we have to do that. There need to be limits. It needs to make sense. It needs to fit into the regulatory context of maybe the campaign finance law system. But those are things that we haven't discussed as a body yet, and there's no bill that's been introduced. Um, or I think even drafted is my understanding. I don't think a bill's even been drafted yet on it. So, uh, so, so that's kind of just where we are. Um, Aaron. I'm not sure I would categorize it that way. I would say that um, hopefully people have seen in five months or a little more than five months that we've been an independent body and whether it's been things that relate to the mayor or the state legislature or the governor, I think we do things in a merit-based way here on the issues that matter to New Yorkers and that the body can come around and have com some consensus around. So. Uh, the mayor has um, asked me about it, but I've said the same thing, which is we have to go through a process, we have to have conversations, and we haven't done that yet. Um, so once we begin to do that, 
there'll be a hearing if someone introduces a bill, but we are nowhere close to that. There's no, there's no bill drafted. There's no, you know, there's nothing that's introduced. I don't know who would, no one's told me that they want to sponsor that bill or put that bill forward. So I think we're at a, a preliminary stage, but I am open to the conversation only because I think it's in, it's like uncharted territory. It's a place that has a COIB opinion, but there aren't laws surrounding it. And, you know, if you looked at what happened on the campaign for One New York, when we saw deficiencies in that kind of unchartered area, unregulated area, the council came back and set up rules for uh, nonprofits and put in limits and did things for people doing business with the city. I would think if we were gonna do something on this, we'd wanna similarly think about those things and have a conversation around that. It's sickening and heartbreaking, horrifying. This man's two children and a wife and was doing his job and uh, has no criminal record and you know just was living his life and showed up to deliver a pizza and now is detained and away from his children and his wife. It's heartbreaking. This is not the country that I wanna live in. This is not the city that I wanna live in. And I think, of course, it's horrific for this family and this individual, but it's also horrific because it sends a much bigger message to immigrants and undocumented folks in our city uh, to strike fear in their hearts. And that is what we're seeing with children being separated from their families at the border uh, and children being lost. It's what we're seeing, we saw with Robbie Rogbier. It's what we're seeing uh, with 7-Elevens that were raided earlier this year. This is a campaign to intimidate and strike fear in the hearts of undocumented folks and immigrants in this country. And it's not the country I wanna live in. And so I am shocked and outraged and I'm really grateful as I said before to Councilman Brandon. I wanna invite him up to give an update or to talk about um, what he's done on this. So we have, um, we've connected um, Pablo's wife, Sandra, with through, um, through partnership with the New York Immigration Coalition. We've um, gotten her an attorney, um, an attorney that has worked on cases like this before uh, to see you know, what can be done. I mean, basically yesterday when we met her, she was shrugging her shoulders, sort of resigned to the fact that this is it, like he's being deported and that's that. So we're trying to give her some hope. We're trying to be there for her to make her realize when the cameras go away that we're still gonna be there fighting with her, very important for us. Um, but I mean, I think like the speaker said, I mean, it's the message that it sends. And this situation was very unique. They knew the guy, he was Pablo the pizza delivery guy. I mean, they knew him on the base. Um, so there's an arbitrary element here that I think is really the scary part, um, that they're enforcing this um, in a way that they had never done before. He always showed his uh, municipal ID, was never a problem always you know, was granted access to the base without issue and for whatever reason you know he some guy was having a bad day or he upset the wrong person or someone was on a power trip or something and it escalated to a level that is just beyond belief um, we were told that the base uh, checked with PD and PD told him he's got no record you should let him go he's got no reason to stay and they didn't like that answer and they escalated it to uh, to ice so um, that's where we're at now. She's in New Jersey today, um, you know, trying to reunite with the, the father because she doesn't know how many days he's got left before he's going to be deported. You're off. which I support. Um, I guess the, the, the question is what, whether, I guess how familiar the, the, the council is with that um, body's work and, and whether you feel like there should be some kind of independent oversight. I heard, I don't know if it's true that, that uh, Imani might uh, introduce le legislation to have an ID overseeing uh, that um, body. But do, do you 
you think there should be oversight of, of that enforcement agency before they're just kind of handed all this data? Um, I, I think that, first of all, I support the bill. Um, and I support the passage of the bill, and my uh, feelings on Airbnb predate any time before I was an elected official when I worked on the local community board in Chelsea and Hell's Kitchen, and we had an illegal hotels working group, and I worked with a lot of housing activists on this starting in 2005 and 2006. So I've been working on this issue for, for well over a decade. This is the first time I've heard this concern about the Office of Special Enforcement. Um, I think it's always important that people's privacy be protected. So if we are collecting information, we want to ensure that that information is protected and that nothing untoward or inappropriate is done with that information. Um, I'm always happy to talk to Jumani about um, more oversight and figuring that out. It's the first I've heard of it. He and I haven't had a chance to have a conversation about it, but I can't really comment on it until I know a little bit more. I think the Office of Special Enforcement has been a really good office from my perspective because when there have been issues, there was an article, I believe, in the Daily News today, it was either today or yesterday, about a building or multiple buildings in Hell's Kitchen in my district where they were warehousing 26 apartments. 26 apartments that they were not renting out, and they were just using those apartments as an illegal hotel that Airbnb was coming, every, Airbnb residents were coming every single day. So the city has sued them. The reason that we got that information was because of the Office of Special Enforcement showing up, doing enforcement, doing interviews, doing investigation. That is how we got it. That is why we are trying to get this data to go after bad actors that are doing this type of work. Uh, that are warehousing apartments that are operating outside of the law and the bill that Councilmember Rivera is introducing today is a bill that is really all about transparency it doesn't change the law i mean it doesn't change like doesn't change how we enforce things or whether airbnb is legal or illegal it just says you need to provide us with certain information um, if you are a home sharing company. So before I go to the rest of the questions, I'm happy to take more. I want to allow Councilmember Vallone to speak about animal shelters, and I want to allow Councilmember Williams to talk about his bill on opioids in the NYPD. Yeah, just to clarify, I 100% support Colleen's bill, and I'm very proud that we have Office of Special Enforcement. So Councilmember Vallone, I said before you got here that you and I have worked really hard on this together, and I adopted my cat from ACNC. <laughs> okay, yes, you did. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the speaker is absolutely right. I remember at the January stated when we elected our speaker, and I looked and I said, animal shelters? And he turned and said, let's get it done. Uh, and here we are today about to vote on making that dream reality. We still do not have every borough a full service animal shelter in every borough. So today we are going to vote to make that dream become reality. I know Bronx has a site. Queens does not. And at our last hearing that we co-chaired together, we heard dates that were just too far out, and that's not acceptable. Dates where we will not be in office, where the uh, mayor will not be in office. This will make it the law. This will make it guaranteed that it must happen no matter who comes in behind us. So today, for our animal activists, for our families with pets, for those who are passionate about our little furry ones, today we will finally say every borough in this great city will have a full service animal shelter and thank you, Corey Johnson, no, our speaker, for making that happen. God bless you, you, and God bless everyone. And multiple else. generations of this, We're going back. My father, as speaker, started it. My brother, uh, my mom, was the real true Valone who made this all happen. Uh, she will be happy tonight, and she will be giving you a special hug thank for you. making it happen. I love Tina Valone. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I want to call up Councilor Williams to talk about the bill that he's passing today. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my bill, 717A, uh, is part of a package dealing with uh, opioid abuse. It is a partner with that package, in particular working alongside Councilmember Cohen's bill, uh, dealing with the FDNY. Mine does something similar uh, with NYPD. I'm, I'm proud that this uh, council is taking important measures uh, to deal with the opioid crisis. I'm very proud uh, that we are dealing with this crisis uh, humanely uh, in a way that shows that this is a, a crisis of people who need assistance, not necessarily uh, need uh, law enforcement and jail. Uh, I could be remiss if I didn't mention uh, that I hope as we move forward uh, when dealing with these issues 
that every community gets dealt with uh, with the same humanity uh, and the same way of realizing that people need assistance and not prison. Unfortunately, uh, when drug use has happened in other communities uh, that looked uh, with some more melanin in their skin or primarily viewed that that was a community, uh, it was treated much differently. And so I hope this is a lesson for us uh, as we continue to move forward. Uh, I did want to mention just really quickly on the Airbnb, as I mentioned, uh, wholly supportive of, of Carlina's bill. Um, uh, as when I was the housing chair, we pushed myself and others to make sure that OSC got the money that they have. I'm proud that they have it. Uh, Airbnb has somewhat successfully used uh, black and Latino homeowners who are not even who we're trying to go after uh, to block us from going after uh, the most bad actors. And so why I have that bill is for transparency. I just want to make sure uh, that I explicitly say uh, that I think the city is doing what they should be doing. I hope they're doing more. If Airbnb would come to the table earnestly, we wouldn't have to do all this. Have you heard your honor yet? Uh, yes, I've heard. Uh, I will say the, the issues that some of the homeowners are, are talking about uh, are specific to them. And there is a way, I think, to address it. But what Airbnb doesn't want to address it. They want to confuse the issue. So the more that they mix these things together, uh, the better they are in protecting themselves from having to go after bad actors where they actually make a lot of money. Great. Uh, who, Will. So the first answer, from your first question, we ask for information all the time from the public, and it's our job to protect their information and use it appropriately and not abuse the information that we have. And that's what we would seek to do on any type of bill where we're collecting uh, data. So I don't think this is all that different, and we're not going to use it to go after every person, it's to know if there are bad actors that are operating outside of the legal framework that's in place to be able to weed out the folks that are really uh, violating the law. As I mentioned before, the Office of Special Enforcement was able to do some good work on a, a, a building in my district where they were literally warehousing almost 30 apartments for a couple of years using as an illegal hotel. It's going to be easier for us to figure out where that's happening when we have more data. Without the data, it becomes much more difficult for us to track down the bad actors and do meaningful enforcement. Anything we do here in New York City is all about enforcement. You know, most, most folks that come up to us on a daily basis in our districts say, how come there isn't more enforcement on X, Y, and Z? Someone's doing this, and how come there's not more enforcement? So you need real enforcement. On the second uh, question, you know, I, I, I've said this in the past. I, uh, I started working on this issue in 2000 and I might get the exact year wrong. It was 2005 or 2006, 2006, 2007, when I was appointed to Manhattan Community Board 4, long before Airbnb took root in uh, the community in, in where I live. I mean, it, it, it expanded quite a bit. Um, and I was, my community board was one of the first community boards involved in working on uh, Senator Liz Kruger and Assemblymember Dick Godfrey's bill on changing the multiple dwelling law at the state level in Albany, which is what set the regulatory framework up of what we're operating under now. So I had a long history in working on that. I worked on it for almost nine years when I was on the local community board. So I actually believe that one of the reasons that uh, and I'm proud of the support that I've received from the Hotel Trades Council in the past. I think they supported me not because they thought I was going to do what they wanted. They supported me because I had a track record of history of being on the right side of the issues long before they ever met me. I didn't meet the Hotel Trades Council until years after I already started working on this issue, which really mattered in my local community. I have the most number of Airbnb listings, I believe, in the entire city in Greenwich Village, West Soho, Chelsea, Hell's Kitchen, the Times Square area, and the Columbus Circle area. So I have more than any, and I can tell you that on a very, very regular basis, uh, we 
talk about, we get complaints. I mentioned at a, one of these press conferences, I don't know if it was a month ago or so, about one of the major activists in the city working on this is a guy named Tom Kaler, who I met back in 2005, 2006 on this very issue. And he has been one of the leaders. He is not, as the as Airbnb likes to say, oh, everyone's a shill for the hotel industry. Uh, Tom Kaler is a housing activist. He's an affordable housing activist. He's been an affordable housing activist in Hell's Kitchen for over 25 years. And he's one of the leading people in the city working on this. He's not paid by the hotel industry. He's not paid by that coalition. He's a hardworking activist that cares about this. And he's the first person that I ever met and worked on on this issue almost 15 years ago, 13 years ago. So I'm proud of my track record on the issue. I'm proud of my uh, the past support I've received from the Hotel Trades Council, and I'm supportive of the bill that Councilman Rivera is introducing today. Last question? Uh, I guess we have a bunch more. I'll, I'll take more. Uh, Samar, I'll come back. Which, which, which snafu? No, but which snafu are you referring to? Um, with the governor and uh, the Congress and about that point one and Oh, so, I mean, I'm not, I haven't been, I haven't had a single conversation with the Department of Justice, the Southern District, so all I know is what's been communicated to me privately, and I think it's important that I allow the mayor and the law department to continue to have conversations that they need to have with the Southern District. This goes back a couple of years. It came out of the lead paint inspection issue. Um, what's been reported uh, in the media on potential settlement numbers. I mean, I've read that in the media. Um, I hope that we get to a settlement, and ultimately what I hope happens from that settlement is that we get a significant amount of money for NYCHA to make life and safety repairs, life, health, and safety repairs as quickly as possible. I think in the past, consent decrees have been helpful, whether, it been, whether it's been on Rikers Island or in other places. But again, I haven't participated in those conversations. What about the state line that is taking more time than the governor's head? I'm not a lawyer, but my understanding is, and I, I had a lot of questions about this myself when it was all happening. My understanding is, is that a federal consent decree from the Southern District would supersede the executive order that was issued by the governor and some of the issues that that executive order was trying to get at are things that sound like are likely to be addressed by a consent decree with a federal monitor overseen by a federal judge in conjunction with the Department of Justice. It will get at what that executive order was going towards. So when the governor said, I think, the end of last week, that he was suspending his executive order for a week or however long, I think that was to give more time, again, I haven't talked with him about this recently, I think that was to give more time for the Southern District and the Mayor's office to continue the conversations they've been having. Yes, sir. We are fighting, we are pushing. Uh, I feel like we hopefully will have um, hopefully a, a deal soon, but negotiations continue. It's one of the major cornerstones and pillars of uh, our negotiations, and it was of our budget response. And um, I think the council's pretty united on this. We had some big priorities. We're fighting for all of them. I continue to have conversations with the mayor every single day about this. And we're gonna be, uh, we're gonna talk internally today as a body to to kind of talk about where we are and hopefully update folks as we go along. Yes, sir. Hey, Dan. Three, three o'clock, we're going to have uh, some taxi drivers and county owners rallying uh, around here, and they're going to be supporting the uh, Councilman Diaz's tax bill. So it's uh, one of his bills, one of a few in the council. Why don't you get an update on the uh, status of a comprehensive campaign industry package? Uh, who's on this team? You have a few members with their own bills. Okay, that's a lot. I'll try to do it as uh, succinctly as possible. Um, staff is working on it. They've been working on it very diligently, working very hard. It's a complicated issue. 
uh, for all the reasons you know, Dan, and I'm not going to go into all those reasons right now, but the devaluation of the medallions, the explosion of for hire vehicle licenses, the, congestu the congestion issue, driver fairness, the tragic, horrific, sad suicides that we've seen since the beginning of the year, uh, you know, ways that yellows are treated but for hire vehicles aren't treated. So those are all the issues we're looking at. Those bills are going through the legislative process, as every bill does. The staff is working on it with the particular members and the committee chairs. That work continues. Um, let me tell you my guiding principles. My guiding principles on this is, number one, have fairness related to both the yellows and greens and the rest of the for hire vehicle industry. How we ultimately define fairness is going to be important, but to create some level of fairness between those two industries uh, that are facing all the problems that I just delineated. Number two, protect drivers. Protect all drivers, not just yellow drivers, but all drivers. Yellow drivers, green drivers, livery drivers, uh, Uber drivers, Lyft drivers. Create something that's going to help all drivers. And then number three, come up with a regulatory framework that makes sense and, again, creates fairness in some way and hopefully tackles the congestion issue in a meaningful way. That's a lot to try to accomplish. There's a lot of bills, and it's going to work its way through the process. Dan, I, I'll, I'll get you. I've got okay. Two questions. Yeah. What the taxi medallion owners are arguing is that they're getting a bad uh, deal negotiated at Melrose with the credit union that's asking for the loan money up front, big sums, um, asking them to put the property up. And what they're calling for is some relief in the negotiations so they have more appropriate deals so they don't have to give up their medallion as collateral, just their home as, as collateral. So the question is, what can the city do? Or is it just the I don't know enough about it. I want to help, again, all drivers. And I think that part of the non-regulatory framework that exists is what put the medallions in this place. Not that the medallion system on its own was perfect. Um, and, but, but the lack of progress on coming up with regulations related to the entire industry is what has created instances uh, like this in some ways. So I'm open to looking at it. I don't know enough about it. I don't want to shoot from the hip and kind of give you an answer when I have to learn about that particular instance and get more information. So I'm happy to have Jen get back to you, but, but I don't know enough about it right now. I don't know enough about it. I'll, I'm happy to talk to... I don't know enough about it. I'm not a lawyer. I'm happy to talk to the staff here, but I don't know enough about it. Grace? Going back to the fair, fair Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> I don't think it's backfired. I don't think it's backfired, but I feel like most of us who run for office learn as we're running to organize, and that typically that organization helps us succeed. And I think sometimes you have to do it on the inside as well on issues that matter to you. And so I think Fair Fairs gave us something really good and meaningful to organize around. I'm really proud of the number of members who have really cared about it and spoken consistently in favor of what it will do for New Yorkers living in poverty. But I thought that it was really important for us to show our deep level of commitment towards it by actually not just putting it in a budget response and talking about it in an ad hoc way, but creating a campaign around it. And the actually the staff here at the City Council, uh, Anthony Perez, and the folks in Jen's office deserve a lot of credit for working really hard on that. And I think part of that campaign has been about telling the stories of New Yorkers who are affected. There was that very moving op-ed in the Daily News from a fast food worker who talked about how much this would help her in her life. And the day that we went out to campaign on this at subway stations, I was standing at the L train stop 
uh, over near Stytown with Council Members Rivera and Powers, and that woman who wrote the op-ed walked over to me and talked about how meaningful it was to actually engage in this in a public way and how she felt empowered by it. So I'm really proud of it. I feel like negotiations continue. We continue to have conversations, and I still feel hopeful. Uh, I'm going to come back to Gloria, but yes, here and Gloria, and then we're done. I, I feel pretty hopeful, though again, I haven't been part of the conversations. Um, I feel pretty hopeful that we're gonna have some resolution on a, on a consent decree and on a settlement with the federal government, and ultimately the Department of Justice and, the, um, uh, and HUD are gonna play a meaningful role, I believe. So I think that's the thing to really focus on, and if we get some resolution there, it takes care of the issues that the governor was seeking to address through his executive order. So I'm more focused on, on that part than, than the rest. On that, um, Councilman Lucy Torres, who spoke to me on Facebook today, just a few moments ago, said, how do we feel the Monica, you are always breaking news <laughs> on NYCHA, seriously. And, but this is the first I've heard of this. I, ha I, have, no, I have literally no information. Um, this is the, literally the first time I've heard this, so I have no idea. I can't comment on I don't know. Gloria, and then we're done. I am supportive of Councilmember Chaka. I agree with how uh, Speaker Mark Viverito handled this issue and how hard she fought on it. I believe in due process. I believe that everyone deserves uh, legal representation. Um, and so I know that Councilmember Chaka has been a major leader on this. He and I have had many conversations about it. I support what he's doing, and I, I supported what the previous speaker did. I think people deserve legal representation even if they've been convicted of a crime. If they've been convicted of a crime and then they go into immigration proceedings related to that crime, they deserve legal representation in those immigration proceedings. Just because you've been convicted of something doesn't mean you shouldn't have legal representation anymore. Um, so this is, not a bus, this is not a saying we think that every person that's committed a crime should be able to stay here. There are gonna be instances where that's not the case. But what we're saying is, in, the, pro in, in the, uh, the philosophy and the principle of due process, that carries on. And we believe that in this very uh, difficult time we're living in, we think that all immigrants should have legal representation as they go into that process. So I support Councilman Chaga. Grace, this is it. This is done. Yeah. And so, A, I wanted to get your opinion on the legislation that's on the table, like his initial approach of what the city can do on its own, and B, wanted to know if the city council, if he's asked you or you're considering some kind of resolution one way or the other on this, because oftentimes the council will weigh in with a resolution uh, on things that affect New York City, like this does. 
So I feel sort of conflicted on this. I mean, uh, I, I tweeted something out the other day when I heard about it in support, and the more I've learned about it, I'm not backing away, but I think it's very complicated, and I want us to handle this in a very thoughtful manner. So I think that the mayor's uh, goals here about trying to ensure that uh, black and Latino students um, rep, uh, had, a, had fair representation in these specialized high schools. I think that's a really worthy and important goal and something that I support. At the exact same time, I've heard the concerns from the Asian um, community here in the city about not wanting to pit different communities of color against one another. And so I'm not sure that one single test should be the thing that gets someone into a school that doesn't happen for Harvard or Yale or NYU. There are multiple factors that are taken into consideration. But I also think, as Speaker Hasty said earlier today, this is not moving forward in this current legislative session. It's gonna come back in the next legislative session. It passed the Education Committee in the Assembly yesterday. It's not gonna go to the full floor of the Assembly. And I'm not sure it would have gotten a vote uh, in any of the Senate committees or made it to the Senate floor given the stalemate that's happening in the Senate right now. So I think it's gonna give us time to actually listen to all stakeholders. It's gonna give us time to go out and talk to all affected communities, to talk about the mayor's proposal, to talk about concerns that people have had, and to have a process where everyone feels heard. I think that's really important. I think the goals are totally worthy, and, and in a visceral way, I supported them. But then the more I thought about it, I think we have to have kind of a, a bigger conversation about how we move forward that respects all stakeholders involved. In terms of time initiative, though, that you think the city council should weigh in on with a resolution, but it does not affect your city. I'm open to it. Um, I would want to have a conversation with the chair of the education committee, Mark Traeger, and I haven't had the chance to have that conversation yet. Thank you all.